This is Living Catholic with Father Don Wolf. Living Catholic is a fresh look at issues confronting each of us today. This show deals with living out the Catholic faith, what that means for Catholics, as well as the impact on the rest of society. You certainly don't have to be Catholic to enjoy this show. And now, your host, Father Don Wolf. Welcome, Oklahoma, to Living Catholic. I'm Father Don Wolf, pastor at Sacred Heart Parish and rector of the Shrine of Blessed Stanley Rother. I've talked a lot lately about one aspect of Christian life we often do not mention. It's the aspect of generosity. For now, as we begin, I'd like to dispense with the suspicion we have when we hear this word, the suspicion that the talk will be about giving money, generosity. Well, this is neither an undue suspicion, since we often do talk about money, and since it is a topic that is sincerely important whenever we're considering real generosity, I'd like all of us to lay this aspect aside and focus on what it means to be authentically generous, apart from being afraid that we're going to be talked out of our money. So entertain these ideas and this analysis without any fear of that. They'll lead to the, without any fear that they'll all lead to the big ask at the end. At least for today, money is not the object. We talk about generosity because it's important in the life of the faith and in the life of the church because it is an essential part of life, period. Without generosity, most of what we recognize simply would not exist. For example, parenting takes place because parents are overwhelmingly generous with their children. They give them more time than the kids strictly need, especially when the children are young. And they invest in their children's future far out of proportion to their return at least out of proportion to the guaranteed return that they can expect from them. Teaching's the same way. Most great teachers are generous with their students. It's possible to arrange the teaching dynamic in terms of so much time plus so much attention plus so much effort portioned out in measurable and discrete ways. But we all know real teaching and the forming of imaginations happen when teachers pour themselves out to their students out of proportion to the expectations and requirements of the job. And personal caregivers, like nurses, are almost by definition generous in what they offer. We all know healing doesn't come in discrete packets and on firm schedules. It happens as the product of the healer's touch. Generous giving is part of life. Of course, you've already noticed that these activities are most often performed by women. They do seem to be the primordial images of selfless generosity. But it's not only they who give. The professor who huddles over his desk to produce a work of disinterested scholarship to educate the upcoming generations, he is also generous beyond bounds. The mentor who cares to spend time with the junior partner is stirring up generous giving. And even the engineer who obsesses about improving the design and function of what seems to be an obvious help to others, he's also generous. These are typically, although not exclusively, male preserves. Generosity does not run only among the feminine. And the world is powered by generous love. True, self-forgetting love is not defined by quid pro quo or strict limits. By definition, it is a commitment of self that exacts a generous response from the one who extends it and is presumed by the one who experiences it. Love would not be possible if it were not a gift from the one who wants to share it. And this is not always simply voluntary. Those who truly love are often tasked with going beyond the limits of their comfort and the confines of their imagination to fulfill the needs of those to whom they're committed. Their love is is described precisely in their willingness to be led beyond what they had thought required, no matter how extravagant, to limits reached only by selfless generosity. If there were no generous giving, there would be no true loving, and we all know it. The last insult to our sensibility would be to be embraced by one who is unwilling to give with a fulsome heart and open hands. Generous giving is the prerequisite of real love. Generosity makes the world, and you and I know, and you and I know that that's what makes it work. And that's the first and most important point. We know that if there were no generous people at work in the world, no one willing to give beyond the bounds of expectations, the world would not only be a poorer place, it would be an unrecognizable one. As a thought experiment, imagine a place in which no one did anything more than was expected. Think perhaps of the caricature of the Soviet state in which the byline was, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. 
In this system, every expectation was outlined and detailed, so everyone at every level of supervision understood what to expect and how to evaluate what was happening. Every interaction in every part of every job was a quid pro quo act with no expectation anyone would go beyond or give more than was expected. The result was a life-killing arrangement in which no one was happy. When there's no generous giving, there's no real living. And this is, isn't simply an accidental byproduct of bad management. It's the nature of our lives together. If all there is is contractual interaction, pretty soon life and everything in it will be measured by its minimums and conducted by its least possibilities. And this is because there is nothing more if there is no generosity and there is nothing beyond the boundaries. I noticed this once when my uncle, who had worked for himself for years and was noticeable for his long hours and his dedication and his good humor, eventually took a job on an assembly line in which nearly every motion was measured, parsed, delineated, and controlled. In almost no time, this man who had given himself to his work with real joy turned into an automaton, jealous of every second away from work unwilling to spend one second more on doing what he was required to do. His labor sucked the life out of him. I thought it had everything to do with the foreclosing of the possibility of him being able to give generously. He bought into the contract offered, nothing more expected, became nothing more wanted, became nothing more gotten. And it was easy to see it took the life out of him. This is the conundrum of life noticed since the beginning of the industrial age. How do we find the basis of true communal life inside of a system in which the possibility of giving has been foreclosed? In the spontaneity and the unspecified nature of family life, it's everywhere. In factories and scientific management, it's almost nowhere. As the question has gradually formulated and the answers have slowly come in, it has migrated to the spiritual realm. More and more, generosity is noted as a religious question and has been answered more often in church than in any other place. This is not because it's a true church issue, but because it has been squeezed out of the other realms, like the questions about sex and the delineation of good relationships benefiting everyone at every level of society in the long term, questions which are posed and then answered almost exclusively by pastors with their people rather than by experts with their patients. The concerns about generosity as a basis for a good life and as a foundational element in making life go have their greatest hearing among congregations rather than among lifestyle gurus. We church people are happy to pose the questions and then answer them. After all, if no one will talk about them, we're bound to since they're part of life. But even in our enthusiasm, we caution the whole world to know we take them on because of their relevance to the whole range of life, rather than because they are exclusive to religion or are bound up only with ecclesial concerns. If we want to have a good life, we'll have to have the occasion for generous giving. If this is missing, our lives will be stunted and we'll know it. This will be true even if we aren't able to name it or we haven't had the chance to learn it. As a kind of primer in the development of this aspect of our lives, we have to make the connection between generosity and gratitude. I've taken the opportunity previously to expand on this connection, but I'd like to mention one aspect of the connection we don't normally think of. But before I do that, I'd like to run through the basis of it. While we may regard it as obvious, the link between gratitude and generosity isn't always made and is thereby not understood. Gratitude is the awareness that what has come to me is greater than my due, or somehow greater than I have the right to expect. If we look at the previous images, my gratitude is due to knowing what I have exceeds the boundaries of my being. For example, if I know I have to ingest the proper number of calories in order to have the energy to get through the day, then I understand the baseline of what it takes to survive, the minimum. But if, I, uh, but if alongside this understanding, I experience receiving these calories in the form of a fried chicken dinner with peach pie, I know this has come to me in a form greater than what's strictly necessary. What I have been given is something beyond the boundaries. If I understand it in this form, I'm grateful for what I have received. It's more than the necessary thing. It's a gift to me. 
Again, because this has been the common understanding of the outline of daily living, we've often not recognized it. It's something like the oxygen in the air or the fertility of the soil. We get so used to it, we presume it and think nothing of it. But in our contemporary situation, in which the common understandings we share have been called into question, it's important to call to mind what was, in other days, common knowledge. Let me give a few examples. In our grandparents' generation, it was commonly understood that we were entrusted with the gift of our body. This was a gift to be appreciated for what it was. It was to be honored and cared for because it was deeded to us beyond our expectation and beyond our control. It came to everyone as a gift to be received. In fact, the very, the very process of growing up was described as an appreciation of what a body is and what its potential meant for the individual and for the world. When a young person went into puberty and the potential for a body was encountered, the individual would begin to experience and appreciate what it meant to live within the, the limits and the capacities of that body. This appreciation continued throughout all of life. As each person journeyed through the years, the experience of living always carried with it the potential for surprise and the capacity to overwhelm. I remember the books I saw when I entered puberty all those years ago. Most of them had been written in the previous generation, and I think some of them came directly from the thoughts and ideas of the generation before that. And I wasn't very interested in them, mostly because they did seem old-fashioned and out of touch with the questions I had, and upon reflection, they probably were. I do remember that the one answer to every question or concern with regard to boys becoming young men was that you should go to daily mass and weekly confession, which I had no interest in doing or could even impossibly imagine happening given, given where we lived and what our schedule on the farm was like. But they did have a few things in them that I do remember. And the first was the admonition that your body has within it the capacity to create a new life. And if you didn't guard the truth of things and you didn't appreciate what could actually happen with what you did, you could find yourself in a situation in which your future and your journey through life could be abruptly and profoundly interrupted. You could even say you could make an eternally bad decision by bringing a new life into the world without much thought or preparation. The author of, the, of those books was trying to get each person to appreciate the gift of the body and its potential for human living. And the more its gift was accepted and understood, the greater a gift it became. This gift was to the individual as well as to the human community at large. Everyone benefited when each person received the gift of bodily potential in whatever form it came and with real gratitude. The message to girls was to be thankful for the capacity to bear new life into the world and to sustain it, a gift given only to them and their kind. The message to boys was that the factors inherent in their bodies allowed them to found life and protect it in intricate and exhaustive ways. A gift more abstract and less immediate than with the girls, but still important and necessary. More than anything, the message was, be grateful for who you are, be accepting of how others are, be aware of how these others might be different than you. The challenge we have in life is to be grateful for how we're made and for the potentials wrapped into the gift of what we have been given. And this challenge is engaging and operative all throughout the years, which is a pretty good way to understand ourselves. Our ancestors may, in fact, have understood a thing or two about what it means to live and grow in a way productive of society and helpful to all. In fact, receiving this message about gratitude for our bodies is also to understand and be grateful for the wisdom of our ancestors. They may actually have not been the narrow, biased Neanderthals we imagine them to be. Rather, they might, in fact, have some wisdom we could use. Not infallible, not unchangeable, but useful. That's what it means to be grateful, to recognize and appreciate what we've been given for what it is. The second example is the gift of celibacy in my life. I've been ordained a priest for 42 years now. I made the promise of celibacy when I was ordained a deacon 43 and a half years ago. The gift of celibate living was given to me as a gift, far beyond my imagination and far beyond my capacity to appreciate it at the time. Over the years, I've grown in my appreciation for how important and how gracious this gift has been to me. It was given to me beyond the bounds of my imagination and as a generous gift. 
I am grateful for having been entrusted with it. Of course, most of the time we imagine the promise of celibacy to be the price a man pays in order to be ordained. We think of it as one of the complications of religious life, and all those things are true. Certainly, there would be many more ordinations if priests could marry, and the complications of religious sisters would look different if forswearing marriage was not a requirement. Over the last couple of generations, certainly since the mid-1960s, the entire conversation about celibacy and religious life has focused on celibacy as a problem of denial and absence. Overwhelmingly, when young men are considering the seminary or young women are thinking of the convent, they're asked to consider what a life without marriage would be. They're asked to consider the lives they're contemplating in the shadow of the negative. My deliberations were just like that. Well, they they included that aspect. When I was being interviewed by one of the members of the seminary board, he asked me what I was going to do knowing I would never have a son to carry on my name. That was something of a shock to me. I was 19 years old at the time and hadn't thought one way or another about having or not having children. But he asked me to consider it, which was one of his responsibilities. But what was left unsaid was how to think of celibacy as a generous gift entrusted to me, one to be unwrapped and valued for all it could be and prized for its place in my life. Most of the time, because I was young and because of the phase of the life of our society, the entire question was focused on the requirement and not on the gift. We were asked to accept what was demanded of us. We were seldom challenged to open the gift. As I've progressed through my life, I've begun to realize that I'd been given a gift greater than I could have imagined when it was first given to me. Simply describing celibacy as not getting married is something like describing a ruby as not being a diamond. Simply describing it as not getting married is something like describing a ruby as not being a diamond, or better, to describe an awards banquet as not being a champagne brunch. What it is not doesn't touch the capacities for what it is. As a celibate, my life has opened up to include the possibilities of encountering people, being attentive to situations and possibilities, of being attuned and free to accept the gifts and the missions God entrusts me with. Throughout the course of my life, the richness of my life has been poured over me in every situation and as part of every aspect of life. As I've gone through the fourth decade of this experience, I become more aware of how grand and just how overwhelmingly positive it has been for me. I've said this over and over at the various anniversaries I've celebrated. In fact, it's kind of a long mantra of description as I look back over the years, but it's this. If I had to sit down and when I was 18 and sketch out the wildest version of what I might be able to do in life with the assurance that it could all come true, all I had to do was imagine it, I couldn't have come up with a richer, more satisfying, more engaging life than the one that I've been gifted Everything is most adequately described with more and greater than with any other adjective. In fact, the grammatical category most adequate to the reality is the superlative. My life has been grand, and all of it was given to me, undeserved, unearned, unanticipated, and unreservedly. I'm grateful for all that I've been given. And when I think of priesthood and all of its potentials, I never I never think of what I have not done. I think instead of all I have enjoyed. Imagining the sum of my life in terms of want or lack is the inverse of the truth and falls to its roots. Now, I hope every life is like this. I don't imagine priesthood is unique in this respect. But I want everyone to know the gift I have been given is a true gift given to me. And anyone who wanted to consider priesthood would have to consider it in terms of its giftedness. That is, they wouldn't be doing it justice unless they thought of it and appreciated it in terms of graciousness and gratitude. Unless gratitude is woven into this reality, it's not really seen. I've experienced generosity at its deepest and in its wildest and its widest forms. And the truth of the world is summed up in gratitude. But of course, we remember the origin of the world and all we receive is God. The overflowing abundance of God's creative act is the source of all we receive. In the creation stories of the first two books of Genesis, the divine initiative is to create, not out of desperation or imperative or dependency, but out of divine love. The goodness of creation has its origin in God's own goodness. And because everything that is, is poured out to make all creation, 
It takes place as the result of God's own generous giving. As we follow the description of the elements of the world as they are created, where every part of creation is intricately fitted together and all is part of the generosity shown through each portion of the created world, generosity is the general description of the divine energy at work there. God's giving is poured out into the world and we receive every part of what we are from this divine gift. God gives generously. So if we want to draw close to God, we do so by way of generosity. As we see, it is written into the fabric of the world. And it's true for everyone, believer or non-believer, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal. In fact, we can make the case that a lack of generosity, the product of a lack of gratitude, which is itself the product of refusing to see the world the way it is, and thus a refusal to trust in the depth of God's creation, is a lack of knowledge of God. It is a profound lack of faith. At this time, in which people do not give generously and cannot endure to imagine what they have, what they have been given as a, is a pure gift to them, we suffer from a profound lack of faith. Generosity is written into the fabric of the world by the hand of God. Those who choose not to wrap themselves in this fabric are those who choose not to grasp God's own hand extended to them. From the beginning of our religious education, we're taught that heaven is our goal, but we can't get there without help. The brokenness of the world we have inherited keeps us from embracing the promise that we were made for. But the gift of God to the world given to us in Christ is that heaven is ours through him. But it only comes as a gift and not as our due. It is the product only of generous giving, not of careful deserving. If we want to practice heaven, we should do our best to imitate generous giving. After all, we can only receive what we're offered when our hands are open. If they remain closed, afraid to give, and too vain to receive, then even heaven's gift will remain unwrapped, unopen, unused, unappreciated, and finally undone. We have a word for a place where, there, where such a gift is simply put in the darkness of the closet and then forgotten about as if it had never been ours to have. We can talk about that at another time. Back in just a moment. back to our final segment, Faith in Verse. We have a poem today called, Ah, I Know. Ah, I know, if you didn't carry on so, it'll be like your rough life was stuck so that nothing remained. So you yell and scream to be noticed. You dream of all that seems clear with nothing feigned. Which is why we perk up you enough to fill our cups and remind us of what's touch so we don't forget. That by tears, You've named the fears of things all dear, and we sing so that we're firm and set. And yes, you're brave, not a fool or knave, have worked to save us all so we can hope. But don't forget, you can bet, there are others who fret at what you get from your topics and tropes. That's all, that's ah, I know. gift of summer is upon us. I hope that everybody has a chance to enjoy it and to uh, celebrate the changing of the seasons. I hope that in the weeks to come, in these summer weeks, that you can join us as we explore what it means to be Living Catholic. Living Catholic is a production of Oklahoma Catholic Radio. To learn more, visit okcr.org.